Now, before I move on to the other secular writers I mentioned earlier, I'd like to take a look at an expanded, more detailed chart from video one. They say a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, I think this deserves a couple of words in addition to that. Um, mainly the assumptions I made when making this chart. If you'll notice, the red represents Jesus' lifespan, but I don't believe Jesus ever existed. So that would be the assumption that if he really lived, then we can plant him right there. The green line, obviously I don't believe either because I don't necessarily believe that Christianity started around 33 CE, probably mm, a little bit later. So that line just represents the Christian story. When Jesus died, he rose again, he sent his disciples out, and from that point, Christianity begins. So those, are, those two, the red and green, are mainly based on the gospel story. Paul's letters, however, it's a general consensus that he wrote his letters in the mid-50s. So that little blue section, we can plant Paul there, although he might have written later. The gospels, uh, I left a range from roughly 70, 75 to say 140 CE. The uh, secular writers I list on the right, starting with Josephus, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I planted them on the timeline where their uh, reference to Christianity and or Jesus occurs. So we can see Josephus uh, would be the earliest, followed by Pliny and so forth. And the other thing I'd like to point out before we move on to look at these writers, um, notice the yellow, the range for the Gospels being written. Compare that to where these authors show up on the timeline. Numbers 6 and 7 represent writers who are clearly and indisputably familiar with the Gospel story. Writers 2, 3, and 4 show no clear evidence that they were aware of the Gospel details. The point being that until the Gospel stories began to circulate sometime around the middle of the second century, did people start referring to those details? Now let's have a look at the other secular writers I mentioned earlier. Pliny the Younger, writing around the year 110 CE to Emperor Trajan, mentions both Christians and Christ, but he does not mention Jesus by name or anything said or done by or done to this Christ figure. Some scholars have even questioned the authenticity of the letter itself as a later Christian forgery like the similar letter to Trajan by Tiberianus, governor of Syria, which has been dismissed as a forgery. If Pliny's letter is authentic, all it corroborates is that Christians did exist at the time of his writing, early 2nd century, in the Roman province of Bithynia at Pontus, a good 1,200 miles east of Rome and about 600 miles north of Jerusalem. It also corroborates the belief that they followed a Christ who is not identified as Jesus of anywhere, much less Nazareth. Pliny's letter does nothing to corroborate the idea that the Jesus of the Gospels existed 80 years earlier, much less that he rose from the dead. It merely corroborates the fact that Christians were in existence in Bithynia, or what is today Northern Turkey, in the early second century. Tacitus, in his Annals, written sometime around 117 CE, makes some amazing references to Christians in that Nero is said to have blamed them for the burning of Rome. And there are some things in this passage that definitely do not add up. Here is the passage in question. Consequently, to get rid of the report, that is, that Nero had started the fire, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, 
But even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then, upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city, as of hatred against mankind. The passage implies that there was a great number of Christians in Rome by the year 64 CE. And not only this, but that they were distinguishable from Jews. It even states that the movement began in Judea and spread to Rome. Strangely, there apparently weren't enough Christians in even Judea for Josephus to write about the sect in his work, War of the Jews, published in 75 CE, a good 11 years later. How large numbers of Christians managed to suddenly appear in Rome in 64 CE when Josephus shows no knowledge of them being in Judea at all in 75 CE, 11 years later, is a complete and utter mystery. Also, along these same lines, Seneca, a Roman philosopher writing at the same time, who was also a tutor and advisor to Nero himself, never once even mentions the sect of Christians in all his writings. Well, sans the forged letters from him to the Apostle Paul, very odd indeed. Another strange fact is that aside from this passage, Tacitus doesn't make one mention of these powerful and dangerous Christians in all his voluminous works. A sect of great numbers so hated and so powerful as to be able to burn most of Rome down would surely merit a couple more sentences at least. The fact that there was not a large number of Christians in Rome during Nero's time almost certainly makes this passage a later and quite anachronistic interpolation. Christian scholars claim that the passage is too disparaging of Christians to be a Christian interpolation. But our earliest copy is from the Middle Ages and certainly after the 4th century, once the whole Christian machinery got going and well-oiled, any Christian would have been savvy enough to insert a passage that sounded disparaging in order to increase the apparent veracity. Unfortunately, they forgot to insert some corroborating fiction into Suetonius as well. But you know me, I like to dig a wee bit deeper. So perhaps we can find more evidence that might further support the idea that this passage was inserted into Tacitus's annals. Um, I meant annals. A capitation tax, that is, a tax on the people themselves, was levied on the Jews instead of Christians to pay for the rebuilding after the Great Fire of Rome. This seems kind of odd if the Christians were the ones who supposedly set the fire, or even if Nero blamed them. Why not tax the Christians instead of the Jews and make the claim against them look even better? Another clue that Tacitus is not the author is that the passage was never quoted by church fathers for hundreds of years. It first appears in the writings of Sulpicius Severus in the early 5th century and appears to be just a random snatch of myth among other myths he wrote. One piece of fiction he wrote is called Life of St. Martin, which contains many miracles and even resurrections and a cameo appearance by Jesus and Satan. Severus's story was later embellished during the Renaissance to show Nero fiddling while Rome burned. None of Severus's contemporaries quoted the passage from Tacitus, so it makes sense that this fiction writing hobby of Severus's was the source in the Middle Ages for the Tacitus passage. And the snippet from Severus's work is almost a word for word match. This would explain how the passage could make it into a copy of Tacitus's annals in the Middle Ages and never be quoted for hundreds of years and contain the anachronisms and hyperbole it does and be critical of both Christians and Rome. Even though Severus was a Christian, he was deliberately practicing the art of forgery. So naturally, he would write it as if he wasn't a Christian. Apparently, his hobby was copying ancient writers and trying to emulate them. 
So the obvious way to create an authentic sounding interpolation was to make it seem as if it was not written by a Christian. But unfortunately, he gets far too many facts wrong and, combined with the silence about the passage for hundreds of years until it shows up in Severus' own writings, this seems like an easy call. Now, I want to take this side street over here. I think we might find something interesting hidden where most people fear to tread. <laughs> 